Hi. Hi. And uh, welcome back. Welcome to the first of the seminars that I'm doing this year. Uh, my name is Arthur Bergeron. My good friend Janice Long just came in, and she's going to be talking actually later on. How exciting! As is my friend Brenda, uh, our, our Cindy Cormier. No, her twin Cindy. The, that's right. The, 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 <laughs> Cindy, you always see here because she's she is a she's always been our my advanced person, or before and after Brenda was. But now she's actually doing something really important in terms of what she and Janice are doing with dementia-friendly communities here in Hudson. So she's going to be talking to you a little bit about that. And then Janice is so. Um, this presentation is brand new, and this kind of role for me is brand new, so you've got to excuse me if I'm boring here, or if I'm a little bit off, um, because I'm trying to do something a little different. If there, right now, there is this really exciting thing that is happening, and you may have heard about it, and that is that three of the Council on Aging Directors, the one from Hudson, Marlboro, and Northborough, are now working uh, in, in, in parallel uh, in each of their three communities to try to work with a group, to form a group and work with a group to try to develop a plan that is specific to their community as to how that community can become dementia friendly. What is that? Well, you know, I've always talked about it in general terms. You know, it's a place where I want to live um, when I'm starting to get old and don't remember things really well. Because I got involved in this work. My mother died in the nursing home. She had Alzheimer's, and my oldest brother has a di di has an early stage diagnosis now. He's 78, and I'm only 66. But you know, it's coming, right? So, um, so what what the three communities are doing uh, is we, we had we had discovered that in Minnesota um, they had developed an interesting model several years ago um, to try to get communities to try to figure out how they could make themselves more dementia friendly and figure out what that means. Uh, and actually, over 35 of them have done that now. Um, so Mike O'Connell paid to have the Council on Aging Directors, together with Christine Alessandro, whom you've met, who runs Bay Path Elder Services, go to Minnesota, go to Minneapolis last uh, August or September, to find out if this was all smoke and mirrors or if it was really doing something positive. And we all came away saying to ourselves, this is really good, this is really, really important. And so that's why these folks are all trying it here, actually supported by a grant from the Metro West Health Foundation. Did I get that right? Which has been really terrific in terms of helping out. But so often when that conversation comes up, that folks are you know, getting the group together and we're going to you know, reach out into the community and we're going to talk a little bit about how that works. But the question in the back of people's minds is, so what is a dementia-friendly community exactly? Um, and so I decided that it might be helpful to people who are thinking about that to think about the way I think about it and to think about how some other people have thought about it around the country and really around the world um, so that you might get a sense of what that community might be like. Well, that community is especially about my old friends Frank and Mary. You know, because you know what their goal is. They want to die and be buried in the backyard. They never want to leave their house, right? Ever, ever, ever. Um, but the issue for Frank and Mary, and by the way, I, every time I look at Frank and Mary, I realize that Caleb Durant, who designed, who, who drew Frank and Mary, really designed them to look like my parents. They really look like <laughs> them. I I see them. You know, it's really funny. The more I look at it. So the question is, in that situation, if Mary starts losing her memory, um, and so she can't do the things that she, you know, used to be able to do, uh, but once again, they really want to stay home. So what do they do? What do they do? Now, what we're not talking about here is the cure. You know, you hear a lot about the cure, and I know the Alzheimer's Association talks a lot about raising money for the cure, and that's great, but not in my lifetime, I don't think, you know? Uh, and certainly not in the lifetime of Frank and Mary. So we're not talking about, we, we understand it would be wonderful if there were a way to, to <coughs> reverse, and no one's figured that out, or slow down substantially, uh, uh, getting dementia. Dementia, once again, is simply a set of symptoms. It's not a disease. The most common cause of the dementia is Alzheimer's. Um, and, the, and the major cluster of dementia symptoms are all around memory loss. And so we're not talking about the cure. We're trying to figure out how my friends Frank and Mary can continue to live out their lives. Now, one of the things that we've talked about before, and I know we brought in someone named, named um, Carol DiRienzo, who actually works with families to try to make their house, to adapt their house, so that if it is dementia friendly. So
so that you're getting rid of rugs and you're getting rid of clutter and you're getting lights and you're making you're reducing the chances of a fall. There are a whole set of things that you can do, and that Carol talked about about how to make your house dementia friendly. But then the kind of the next question is, you know, except that you don't live just in your own house, right? I mean, because you live their house is in a neighborhood. And the question is, what can it be about that neighborhood that can make that neighborhood better for Frank and Mary? So, you know, there were really a whole, there were a set of things that can happen there, but they are all about the neighbors. They're not about Frank and Mary. And they're about making a neighborhood where all of your neighbors know what dementia is and what it looks like. And that it's not contagious, you know, and, and that and that there are conversations that you can have with somebody who who has memory loss. They can't be a constantly saying, Why do you remember don't you remember your name? Or, you know, you remember me, don't you? You know, they can't be about that, but they can be about a whole bunch of things, you know, especially if you're keeping in the present. And so a piece of a dementia friendly community is really about helping those neighbors understand all of those things, giving the neighbors some kind of basic training, um, as well as a place, somebody to talk to if they want to learn about it, or a place to go, like the library, so that people can kind of learn about it, so that the neighbors have awareness, and therefore, the per so that Mary is not ashamed, and Frank is not ashamed. Because one of the things we've talked about here is one of the problems with Alzheimer's and with dementia is not that Alzheimer's isn't considered to be a disease, it's considered an embarrassment. An embarrassment. It's a disease, and there are symptoms, and these are the symptoms, right? So there are things that you can do in your neighborhood, but going beyond that, what else? Well, what is, what is the role of the police in all of this, right? Now, interestingly, um, the police, there actually are a number of programs that have been developed by the, the Association of Chiefs of Police to deal with these issues. Now, my initial thoughts when I was kind of just when I was putting this presentation together were I had heard about this safe return program. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Another another possibility in terms of the technology that is now available, right, is if people weren't embarrassed to say they had dementia, right, because everybody lives someplace in a real place. Well, you know, your assessors have a map that shows all of that, right? It's called the assessor's map, right? And it's online. So, and, and, and when you have a, G, and it's based on GIS, Geographical Information Service Center. S, GIS, yes. System. Thank you. And one of the things about GIS systems is you can add a data layer to the system and, su and kind of superimpose that electronically. So you could, if people were willing to say they had dementia or their caregivers, you could actually create a map of where everybody lives who has dementia. And therefore, going back to that neighborhood slide, you could think about making sure there was somebody in everybody's neighborhood for people who have dementia, although that's a lot of neighborhoods, right? Who does have that kind of awareness and has that kind of training. Um, you, can all, you can also, there are, there are programs now whereby folks with dementia, they'll, they'll have some kind of an ID that's kind of in their wallet or available so that if they are wandering and the police bump into them, they're going to know who that is. And then there's the safe return program, which is actually medical alert and safe return. They are programs that have been developed, among other things, with the Alzheimer's Association, and they're programs designed to make sure that if a person uh, gets lost, that they're going to get found. Uh, and a part of that involves actually having a registry, right? Um, another part actually is something similar to, I believe, what is done in Hudson. Janice, do they have a program in Hudson where if you ask them to, they will call every day? Mm -hmm. Somebody, is it from the police Are department or is it volunteer? It's the police department. The police department. And, and so th those kinds of programs, I know, the, I mean, that program is really designed to make sure you don't drop dead, you know, like they call. No one's answering. Mm, maybe we should go check that house, you know. But to have a, pro a program where people are connected that way so that you're not afraid, especially because, as we all know, if, you've got, if you have dementia, if you have memory loss, one of the great fears is being left alone. I remember when my mother was going through it. That was the hardest thing for my dad. My mother, she, he couldn't leave. He just couldn't leave the house. 
She was so afraid of being left alone. So trying to figure some of that stuff out at the police department level. What about from the fire department's perspective, right? How do we make sure that when the fire department shows up at the house because some kind of an emergency has, show, has happened, and you know, you, you've seen the situation and people show up at the house because it was an, a 911 call. So who shows up? It's the ambulance, right? If they call for an ambulance, or if it's a general 911 call, a lot of times a fire truck shows up. And you say to yourself, those are my tax dollars at work? What the hell is that fire truck? What the heck is that fire truck doing there, right? <laughs> Wasting my money. Well, and does anybody know why the fire truck shows up? Raise your hand. Uh, it's because only firemen, not policemen, not the ambulance guy, only firemen can break through the door. The door is locked, you can take your axe. I'm going through that door. They have the right to do that. So if there's a 911 call, you don't know what's going to be going on, and you know, but you know you've got to get into that house, right? So that's why the fire truck shows up. So the question then is when the fireman gets there, I mean, do they know enough to know, if you see the lady that's on the floor and she's kind of bru bru bruised, that the question isn't what happened? Well, you know, if you're an Alzheimer's person, wrong question. I don't know what happened, you know. I'm fine. I'm all, I'm all fine. I was just speaking to someone who, you know, encountered a good friend of hers who, j she just happened to be going by, so she decided to stop into this older lady's house. And the lady answers the, answers the door, and she's got, like, blood coming from her head. You know, and she's looking, and the woman says, and, and the woman says, so what happened? Oh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. I'm, what, what do you mean? I'm fine. <laughs> you know, you don't know. So you need people who are trained to know the questions, and going back to that registry question, ideally, you have some coordination among the, the, the Board of Health and other officials so that you have a sense of who those folks are. So they're not simply jokingly known of, of as the frequent flyers. Go talk to a lot of firemen and a lot of fire departments. Oh yeah, I know her, you're right? The frequent fly. We're always over there, right? Well, yeah, you're always over there because we haven't figured this out. So the system isn't really working right now. If the system is that every couple of weeks the ambulance, the fire truck, and the policeman go over to the house, something's wrong with the system, right? So it's figuring out that system and also getting that same kind of training for the ambulance folks. Because as you know, you don't have your own ambulance service. None of the three towns, these three towns, has an ambulance service, right? So they're all, you know, the, so the, it isn't the firemen that are doing this. So the, fi so the ambulance service really needs that kind of training. Um, what about if you're going to the hospital? The scariest thing is to go to the emergency room at Marlboro Hospital with your relative who, is, who has got dementia, right? Who's got Alzheimer's or whatever reason because something happened to him and you go to the triage nurse. Right? And the triage nurse starts talking to the person with dementia. What happened? And the son is like, dementia. And the lady is like, nothing happened. Nothing happened. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> nothing happened. So, and the triage nurse, because what they're trained to do is, for confidentiality purposes, they're trained to say, I'm only supposed to be talking to the patient. I'm not supposed to be talking to these other people. Right? So, we need to be addressing. The, the folks at triage who are, bring, who are taking, they, they are the front door of the hospital. They're the place where all these people show up, right? And to know that there are some questions that you want to ask or that you want to deal with this. Or you want to make sure that, once again, there's some kind of an ID system in, internally. Because where do people go from Hudson and Marlboro who are going to the hospital? Well, usually they go to Marlboro Hospital. Not always, right? Which means if you're Marlboro Hospital, if you're UMass, you really, need, you really need to develop that database so that you can be in conjunction with these other players. So there's actually, you know, God forbid, a system to make, to make sure that if someone has that kind of emergency that they're going to be dealt with. So you need training of all of those people, of the, of the triage folks, right? Um, and ideally, you need information that's available regarding previous diagnosis. Um, because it's important when the, when the triage person, you know, goes to the little machine and looks at the, the diagnosis, that if something pops up, if there, if, if, even if this person hadn't been there before for a medical emergency like a fall, if there's some information that says they have dementia, then there's a way to kind of deal with that. So there's the hospital, and, the, and, now, and then the same thing applies in the doctor's office. I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to clients who will say, 
that they're going, or they and their, their spouse or their parent is going to the doctor's office, and the doctor doesn't want to talk about this stuff. Right? He just doesn't want to mention it because he or she doesn't want to bring it up because sometimes the, you know, the patients take it the wrong way. What do you mean? I'm fine. You know? But to make sure that when you're getting your regular checkup, that that regular checkup includes some memory screening. It's, it should be just part of how you're doing. It should be like your blood work. It should be like the other stuff. So that there's some kind of kind of monitoring once they, you know, how often do you go in? You know, once every six months, once every year, to kind of figure out what is going on. So once again, it's a matter of figuring out how we can coordinate that among, because there aren't that many, right? How many, you know, how many, um, um, inter, you know, internal medicine folks or primary care folks are there in this whole community? 10, you know, 15, this isn't a lot of doctors, right? So you can, if, and if everybody's doing it, then you can figure it out. So once again, it's a screening question, it's a training question, and also, for many, many of these general practitioners, they don't know the, the specialist to refer people to, right? The, the people, the, 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 uh, the, the neuro, I can't think of the term, the neuro something or others, right? The specialist doctors who just do this, right? So that if you've got a, 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 a patient of yours, who is having these issues, you can, you can send them to somebody who can figure out the cause of the issues. Because remember, as we said, dementia is a set of symptoms, it's not a disease. There are, Alzheimer's causes about 70% of these, the other 30% though is other stuff. There's vascular dementia, there's dementia when people get these, those little, what I always refer to, here, refer to as mini strokes, right? Or there's something called Lewy body dementia. Anybody heard of Lewy body dementia? Raise your hand. That's about the right ratio, about one out of 30, right? I've heard it referred to as the most common disease that no one's heard of, right? Lewy body dementia, um, if it's Lewy body disease, uh, one cluster of the symptoms involves dementia, but another one is hallucination, right? So for example, the guy who just committed suicide from California, the actor, the funny... Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Apparently, when, that's apparently what his diagnosis was. Imagine being Robin Williams, right, a zany guy, and you've got dementia and you're hallucinating. Imagine Robin Williams. Robin Williams sounded like he was hallucinating all the time. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, you can see why he really had some problems. So, so to be trying to find the specialist that can do those kind of diagnoses, right, and have all of the doctors that we know of agreeing that that's, that that's the way things are going to happen. Then, I mean, you've heard me use this example before. You know, in a dementia-friendly community, I go to the restaurant, and they don't give me the menu with 50 items, you know. It's Mr. Bergeron, so would you like the chicken today or the fish? Or even more simple, Mr. Bergeron, you know we have the chicken today is terrific. What about that? Because in that kind of restaurant, ideally, um, those people actually know you, right? I'm going to go back to that one. Those, those folks actually, they know who you are, they've seen you before. I remember talking to Michael Kennedy over at Kennedy's, right, in Marlboro, who was on with, with me uh, and a bunch of others on the initial committee in Marlboro that's trying to develop this in Marlboro. And he's really interested in this because they've been there for a long time. So they have a whole bunch of regulars who now have dementia. You know, they've been going to Kennedy's for 30 years, and it's still the highlight of a lot of folks' lives. Um, but some of them don't really remember real well. But they know them, so they kind of know what the food is that they want. So it's, you know, it's the menu, it's, it's making sure the signage in the restaurant is good, or any place is good, so they don't get lost. Perhaps it's, it's about having a special menu, right? Who, or perhaps it's about having special hours. This is one of the interesting things um, at, at Pleasantries, and I think we've had... Do we have two slides of this? Yeah. We've, we've, we've had um, Tammy Pazaricki, who runs Pleasant Trees, come over here because um, she has a program that she runs. At, it's practically on the Marlboro Hudson line um, down, by the, down by Fort Meadow. Uh, and it's for caregivers and for those having, having early or mid-stage dementia. She has typically about 12 people you know, in any one day. What I didn't know where she was the first person uh, in Massachusetts to develop what is referred to as a memory cafe. A memory cafe. So a cafe, a, a place that feels like, you know, it's a cafe and people are getting together and, and spouses typically will go, right? And so it's a place for the spouses or, or, or the caregivers to be interacting as well as the folks with Alzheimer's to be interacting, right? 
uh, and kind of getting to know each other. Uh, so this was the first one, but the in, one of the interesting things, th this is actually a picture, and I'm sorry we didn't label this one, we will for the next one. This is from a memory cafe in uh, Minnesota, a uh, small town in Minnesota called J. Arthur's. I like the name of the restaurant. Um, and, but, but interestingly, so this is a memory cafe that's in a cafe, right? It's in J. Arthur's Cafe, but every week on one day from 2 to 4, when there's nobody there anyway, Right? I mean, who's at a restaurant at two to four in the afternoon? You know, um, they they invite families, you know, you know, folks with dementia and their caregivers to come and just socialize, so that among other things, the caregivers themselves kind of get to know each other. Um, this relates to one of the, the things that Cindy Cormier had talked about. And you're going to talk about that later on, right? But 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 re remember, I said that when Cindy is when Cindy is talking. So actually, having places, probably, you know, when I think of I think of Kennedy, right? Or a good friend of mine and I were drinking last night, my friend Trish Pope, who's, the, who's the, now the head of the Council on Aging in Marlboro, but we just drink a lot together. She's a lot of fun. So, so we were at Wellies, and we ended up talking to the two owners of Wellies now, because they're the ones that want to be the first ones in Marlboro to do it, right? And they want to be kind of talking about doing it starting next fall, you know, on a, on a Saturday for a couple of hours. And ideally, you've got one in Marlboro, and you've got one in Hudson, and you've got one in Northboro. So that if you're a person who has dementia and a caregiver, you're basically saying, oh, it's Saturday, so where do you want to go? Right? Saturday afternoon, and there's like five memory cafes that can, we can drive to within like 20 minutes. So it's not like we've got to go to one place and we're seeing the same old people, and I never liked them anyway. You know? But you, know, you can kind of like drive around and find the places that you like. So, um, and you know, I, whenever I think about this in Hudson, honestly, I think about checkerboards. Just maybe, maybe it's just me. But my or my wife, we always go down there. I don't think there's a more family feeling place than checkerboards, right? So the notion of that, I mean, imagine that, you know, in some of the booths in the on the side there on a on a weekday from two to four. Now, I mean, how good would that be? So once again, so next thing, supermarket. So if you're going to the supermarket, can you make that? That is an experience that no matter who they people are, somebody's got to go to the supermarket, right? And it's actually not a bad place for the person with dementia and their spouse to go because it's really level, right? It's really flat. You can kind of walk around and you can kind of, it's very bright and all that stuff, right? And you have to do it. And, and, and Mary can push the cart. She may not necessarily, you want her to be the person picking out the groceries, right? But it can be, a, you know, a real experience. So then the question is, so is there somebody there at the supermarket that gets this, right? really in two different kinds of roles. Is there somebody there that can be helping you find what you want to find? Because, you know, the person with dementia isn't the ideal person that you can say, yeah, it's in row 12, right? That's going to be a long time. They're going to be trying to find row 12, you know. But, if, but, but pe people who can actually go with you to that particular item, or, just, or, or if you bring a list, they'll help you with the list, right? And when you go to checkout, is there somebody that's going to help you with change, that's just going to be able to deal with that stuff because they're trained? Now, one of the, um, I don't know if I've got an example of it. So I'm just using Stop and Shop as an example. But um, when we were researching this, we found there was a, uh, there were a couple of great examples. There was one place Wisconsin. in. Wisconsin. In, in, no, there was a great place in Great Britain. What was the, na the name of the place? I don't remember. And they had, and they, um, and they were, they decided they were really going to focus on this, and then there was a chain. Oh no! And that and he was the person who said, "What we need is mental ramps, mental ramps." Right? This is the head of the store. He said, "You know, you go into a store, you've got a disability. Well, they take care of that now, right? Because of ADA, everything's got a ramp. Well, what you need if you're a person with dementia is a mental ramp, right? You're not crazy. You're not. You're not. You're not. You're not. You know. You're not. You're not a. You can go. You just need a little bit of help." So the, the point is to give you a little bit of help. The New Zealand case that I remember um, was there was a group, there was a, a New Zealand chain of supermarkets that agreed to do this. It was in New Zealand it ain't that big, so the chain was like 17 stores. It was the national chain. So the the, uh, they, the person who headed it invited all of his store managers for training, so that he they in turn could go train some of their staff. And so he said to the to the to the store manager, so does anybody here, you know, have any personal experience from family of someone who has dementia? Fifteen out of seventeen raised their hands, you know. One of the interesting things about this whole initiative 
is that it's going to make people appreciate how many people are there who have dementia. I mean, how many people know somebody who has dementia? Just, or, or who had dementia, now they're dead, right? Just about everybody. So there's a lot you can, so it, I think, for, so for me, this is what I want. I want a store that outside it says, Frank and Mary are welcome here, right? Even if Mary can't quite figure things out, Frank and Mary are welcome here. Same thing with the shopping mall, right? Can you, can you design, pro, you know, can you make sure that at the major stores at the shopping mall that there are people who are, who are aware and are, you know, looking to help people with dementia? Or at the big mall, you know, at the one in, at, at Solomon Pond in Marlboro, which is an indoor mall, where a lot of folks go who have, who are taking, who are caring for someone who has dementia, right? Because it's indoor and it's all safe and it's on the same floor. So how can we figure that out? What about if you go into the pharmacy? Is there somebody in the pharmacy that can help you? That's kind of one of the most dangerous places for a person with dementia to go, right? Is to the pharmacy because you're kind of not sure maybe exactly what it is that you're looking for. So how do we have those pharmacists? And I, and I, I think Janice, Janice Long was telling me that I think you, you, you had spoken to somebody who was from, from Hudson, who was, and they were really interested. I think it was the, was it the Walgreens? The Walgreens. The Walgreens. So, so, so then, and, and then, how about when you're just going out for a walk? I mean, look, you know, what do you, this sounds terrible, what do you do when you're retired? What do you do when you're retired, right? I mean, whether you're here or you're in Florida, right? You may be in a great destination, you may be in a giant house, but you are in your house, or you're at a store, or you're at a restaurant, or you're outside, right? So, the que so that's the same thing here, right? So the question is, can you make your parks be places, public places, be places that are safe and special for people who have dementia because they all want, right, to get out. It's the best thing for folks who have dementia to get out of the house, to see the sun, because it orients you so you don't find yourself in that cycle where you're sleeping all day and then up all night and your caregiver is going nuts, right? Um, is it safe? Is it flat? Is it designed so that if you're walking around, um, it's a pleasant place. By the way, there's a if, if we see we have to add the website on, on this one. There's a this is a picture from a from a Seattle park because Seattle has there's a whole piece of their website Seattle Washington that is dementia friendly parks. It's dementia friendly parks and recs. So they're consciously designing parks and doing tours in those parks. It's it's like the restaurants, right? It's like the dementia. It's like the the memory cafes. So you've got act activities once a week, once every couple of weeks, specifically for folks who have dementia and their caregivers, right? The Parks and Rec is sponsoring. Um, there was one great one, they had, there was, a, there was a, a drumming circle for folks who had dementia, because I think one of the things we've talked about is that, that you know, I think John Zeisel and many others, I don't think Zeisel has been here, has Zeisel ever been here? No. Who was this really kind of expert in a lot of this stuff? Has. But he but has. he has but he runs Heart, the Hearthstones. The Hearthstone is the one that's at New Horizons in Marlboro, and there are also several other Hearthstones. But he talks about the fact that for folks with dementia, the things that you keep, I mean you lose some things, you lose a lot of brain cells, but you keep a lot, right? And a lot of what you keep is your appreciation for art and music, he says especially rhythm, right? So in Seattle they have a drumming circle that for, for dementia sufferers in the park once a week. It's just kind of a little neat thing. So, um, how does that apply to the rail track, right? The perfect place to be going for a long walk, right? It's totally flat. How can you, how can you make that a special place? Or, what's the name of that park? The one that's on the river? Wood Park. Wood Park. Wood Park. This wonderful place, you know, with the little, with the, with the, with the, uh, the uh, yeah, the, the place where you can do music, right? Relatively safe, a little close to the water, so you want to be a little worried about that, right? But otherwise, you know, just a wonderful place. How do you think about how those places can be really special? Do you look for day programs, exercise, for, you know, exercise, and, and how, do you try, how do you provide the caregiver support, right, for all of these people who are trying to deal with this day to day? Um, and that's really a question for what should be happening at the senior center. So, in a, in a dementia-friendly community, where are the real kind of centers of the, of the dementia-friendly community? Well, one of them is right here, right? And it just so happens that you've got a director that's really interested in this. This is an appropriate place for people to be getting together and exchanging knowledge, for there to be programs, and for there to be a sense that you, 
as advocates, can be helping these other folks who have dementia. So the senior center is key. What about assisted living, like New Horizons, like Whitney Place, like Colvin House, right? It may be, remember, in those folks, for those folks, all three of those places have memory care communities. So you've got key parts of that community where you've got folks with memory loss, which means every one of those places has staff that every day is dealing with all of these issues and is at the end of the day getting together and saying, so what happened today? You know, and they're kind of trading stories. Geez, you know, Frank had a real problem here today. Or Mary had a real issue, and this is how we dealt with it. So they're constantly increasing their knowledge regarding how to deal with particular um, 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 things that people do who may have dementia or family situations. They are the natural, I, I find, the natural training centers for all of you and for a lot of us because they're dealing with it all the time because I think dealing with folks with dementia isn't about one quick 40 minute training session you know and you learn two or three things and that's all great but what you really need if you're a caregiver or a person with dementia is you need an ongoing set of people you can talk to and say this just happened and it didn't work out well what happened what did we do wrong here how can we improve this um, finally there's the nursing home. One of the slides that we haven't got yet is the picture of the nursing home with a big moat around it, right? Which is the way we all think of nursing homes. Oh, they went over to the other side, <laughs> right? I never want to go to a nursing home. Oh, now she's in the nursing home, right? And even, like, friends and relatives don't want to go there, right? Let alone anybody else, right? So folks end up in a nursing home, and it's like they're already kind of dead. It's kind of like limbo, you know? They're not quite dead, but, you know, they're in the nursing home, right? So the question is, and I'm not telling you that I think the reservoir is such a great nursing home. You know, if I, if I, last time I saw it, they still had like one star out of five on the, on the CMS website. Not great, right? On the other hand, that in many ways, for many nursing homes, that's the future. Because there's a reason why these nursing homes are deteriorating right now. And, and I feel personally kind of responsible for this. I'm part of the problem, right? Because I'm explaining to people all the time how they can qualify for mass health. I told all of you, you can always qualify for mass health. So the percentage of people in that nursing home on mass health now, maybe 80%, 85%, right? And mass health doesn't pay a lot of money. And if you're not getting a lot of money, someplace, something's got to give. You know, you're going to cut back on services. So the question, and that's not going to change nationally. Mass Health is not Medicaid is not going to start, you know, increasing its budget a lot, right? As it is, there are all these complaints about Mass Health, right? We're going to talk about that actually next on our next seminar. There's a there's a whole effort to in, to increase collections after people die for people who have been on Mass Health, right? Because Mass Health now consumes 40 percent of the state budget. <coughs> So the question is, what can we do, though? Isn't this part of what the community needs to do as, as a community? Don't we need to be not giving more profits to the guy who runs the reservoir, but maybe helping make it a nicer place, maybe with pictures, maybe with activities for folks who are there, maybe just with visits, so that the people, so many of those people never, ever see anybody, right? Isn't that part of our responsibility, right? Maybe we should try to figure, figure some of that out. Or maybe we do want to find, I love that picture. That's a, that's a nursing home uh, on the top there. It's in Alaska. In Alaska. Um, and, and, and this is a picture of the dining room in the nursing home. Maybe we, maybe we consciously want to be looking at a very different kind of nursing home. When we say we never want to go to a nursing home, we immediately picture what that is. Suppose it's a, it's a place where you don't have more than 20 people who are residents, and where the staff, as opposed to being, you know, nursing and activities and this, it's more like a halfway house, and the people are all kind of there with you, and you have the and the and the, and the bedrooms are around a central core, and you have one big dining room where everybody is eating together, and where those folks who are in the early stages of or, or dementia, who can still do some things, are still helping out and setting the tables and doing this and doing that. It may be if it's a community, this would never work nationally as a national program, of course. But if it's a community nursing home, right? If it's the Hudson place, where Hudson people all are, 
Maybe people would support that, right? So then, and, and finally, what about Frank? When I say finally, you know, we've talked a lot about me. What about Frank? What does he need? He needs education, right? He needs to know how to deal with Mary, right? He needs support. He knows that he can got somebody he can talk to when it wasn't a great day. He needs a life, right? He needs to sometimes be able to not be with Mary. Because he's with Mary all the time, and he's losing his grip. And he's been, I always tell my clients, I said, you know, the worst thing you can do for your, for your spouse with dementia is die. If you die, your spouse is stuck, right? Because she's going, or he's going, to a nursing home, right? So take care of yourself. You've got to take care of her, right? So that's going to take money, right, for the training, for the facilities, for the programs. So where's the money going to come from? So uh, to me, there are kind of three possibilities. There's God, right? Money might fall out of the sky. Oh, I know. We'll get a grant from who exactly? Somebody, some place with grants come from, right? That's the same thing as falling out of the sky, right? So there's one strategy, and that's prayer. But I always, you know, tell my clients, prayer is not a plan, right? Well, depending on what you're looking for. But in terms of money, prayer is not a plan, right? Um, or there's the government, right? There's the government. So maybe Uncle Sam will take care of all of this. Maybe if Bernie Sanders win, uh, will, wins, Uncle Sam really will take care of all of this. But I don't think Donald Trump's going to take care of all of this. So the question is, where's the money going to come from? And the answer is, um, it's going to come from us. It's going to come from us. So a piece of working on a dementia-friendly community and figuring out what you need is thinking about stuff and thinking about how we're going to be working together to find the money locally. Because it's not, going to, it's not going to fall out of the sky. So I wanted to have Cindy now talk about what she's actually doing here in Hudson so that she get a sense of how that process is working. And then I wanted Janice to talk for a few minutes about where she thinks this thing is going to go. Cindy. How many of you here know Cindy? Raise your hand. Yeah, so you don't know that Cindy's a local. She's a Hudson person. Born, raised, and still living here. <laughs> yeah. so, good afternoon. I'm Cindy Cormier. I'm working with Bay Cap Health Services, which is an ASAP in this area, um, aging services access point for this area. Um, they were able to get some funding from the Metro West Health Foundation to bring on somebody to help coordinate um, dementia-friendly communities, which we're calling Come to be Dementia-Friendly. Um, this, okay. this is a program that um, is near and dear to my heart. I'm a caregiver to my mother, and so I understand all of the um, joys. The joys <laughs> of the caregiving. Exactly. Uh, what Come to be Dementia-Friendly is, is it's a way to figure out what it is that we need to do in our, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. As Arthur mentioned, there's lots of different ideas, but we need the community to decide what it is that needs to happen here. So it's a grassroots, volunteer-driven um, collaboration. It's not a day cap effort. It's not a senior center effort. It's a community effort. And um, we're using the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. Act on Alzheimer's was developed out in Minnesota. They've already implemented, I think, 38 different communities. Um, if anybody goes on to the Act on Al's, Act on Al's and there's a, there's a uh, slide at the back of your package with the website, you can go on and you can see the types of things that have already been done out in Minnesota, and those are the types of things that we're hoping will be implemented here. Uh, it creates a community for people with dementia and their family caregivers. It uh, gives them uh, information. Um, helps you to be sensitive to the disease um, <coughs> and how to treat these folks with respect and keep them in their homes and give them a good quality of life. Uh, Dementia-friendly community, I've just talked a lot about this. Um, it's where our community, depending on where you are in the community, how they can react to this disease and be sensitive to it. 
So, for instance, in the healthcare uh, area, um, they promote early diagnosis and um, use dementia best, best care practices, um, residential settings that offer memory loss services and support. My mom lives in assisted living. Um, she's not ready for a memory care unit, but there's some things that could help happen within assisted living that could allow her to live there a lot longer before we have to move up to the next level of care, which costs a lot more money. Um, dementia aware, responsive legal and financial planning that, um, you know, there's folks with dementia that are sending money off to scams and we really need to put some things in place, whether it's through the banks or through financial planners to help to monitor those things and keep folks from doing that kind of thing. Um, welcoming and support of faith communities. We've heard a story about somebody that was asked not to come to church anymore because they were disruptive. So we don't need that to happen. Um, what we would like to see is maybe, maybe there's a special service that folks that are having issues can go to. And maybe it isn't a whole mass or, or service. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's just fellowship and music, which is something that folks with dementia seem to enjoy. Uh, let's see. Support of options for independent living and meaningful community engagement. I have just talked a lot about that, you know, being able to go to parks, having things that you can do, take them to, to, um, to memory cafes, that type of thing. And then the emergency services, again, I just spoke to that as far as um, the uh, fire and police departments. Um, here in Hudson, we had our first action team meeting, which helped us explain what that is in a second. And um, Officer Wendy, who's the, um, Officer Wendy, who is the senior liaison in town, um, she said that she's gonna get, get started on putting together a form because we're talking about having a table at the Hudson Fest just with some information about Alzheimer's and stuff. So she's going to put together a form that people can um, fill out, and of course it's all voluntary, it's not a requirement, um, about their parents or whoever that has Alzheimer's and maybe with a photo of that person so that they can have that on file and if they get a call or if they find somebody wandering, they can kind of look through, they think, oh, that's Joe, he belongs over on Avon Drive, whatever it is and some contact information to be able to get a hold of somebody um, that take care of the situation. So um, where this is going to take place, uh, we're doing this in Marlboro, Hudson, and Northboro. Um, these three communities, the Council on Aging Directors went with Arthur and Christine Alessandro, who's the director of Bay Half, they went out to Minnesota and they learned about this toolkit that Minnesota used or put together, I should say, they developed it and now we're sharing it with a lot of folks. Um, they learned about that and decided this is something we should take back and so um, we've started, it's the pilot program I call it, with Marble, North and Hudson. Once we implement these three communities, we'll look at three more communities um, within the Bay Path umbrella, so the towns that Bay Path um, services. Right, and during, yeah, at 2010, 2010 census, the total population for these three towns was 71,717. Um, for folks over the age of 65, there were 9,397. One in nine individuals over 65 has Alzheimer's or has some type of dementia and that comes to 1,043. Those numbers are climbing very, very fast because of us baby boomers are now starting to get to that age. Um, some other interesting statistics are that in addition, <coughs> one in three people over the age of 85 will most likely get some type of, of dementia. Alzheimer's, I'm oh, sorry, Janice, go ahead. Can I just add to yes. that? Yes, yeah, you um, have some current numbers too. Right, um, just, um, because I'm involved in this too, I took some census figures from August 2015 and did them just for Hudson. And there's between the 65 and over the 85 population, there's over 520 people with some form of dementia. Hudson alone right now, well, as of August, August numbers. So, you know, when you put it in perspective with your own little community, you know, kind of it's Wow, that's August. And then I just learned from at an MCOA meeting 
that some new census numbers are coming out April 1st. There's 275,000 people over 60 that were unaccounted for. In, so, in Massachusetts? In, right, I'm sorry. In Massachusetts, not in Hudson. So, you know, those numbers are going to be, the, the 520 is going to be even greater. So and you also to have to wonder about some of these numbers, too, because I think that there's a lot of folks with dementia that nobody knows about. It's not been diagnosed by a doctor. It's not been reported to the Alzheimer's Association. So I think the numbers are much higher than we actually have here. Um, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death, death in the U.S. And it's the only cause of death in the top ten causes of death in the U.S. that can't be pre prevented, cured, or slowed down. Uh, in 2015, Alzheimer's and other dementias cost the U.S. $226 billion. So it's definitely something that we need to be looking at. Um, so this is the process for the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. This is the process that we're going to go through in these three communities. And the first phase of the process is convened. That's where we look out to the community and we look for folks. We, we, put a notice out to say, hey, we want to do this type of thing, and folks come to the meetings. We've had our community meetings in all three towns, and we got great turnout. Um, in fact, here in Hudson, we got over 50 people that came from all different walks of life, which is very important. Um, and the same thing in Marlboro and Northbrook. We then had those folks come to their first action team meeting, and that's what they're calling the core group of folks that are um, running this program. The second phase is, and, and I should back up and say that in this convened stage, what we're looking for is people from all different sectors. So we want somebody from the first responders. Of the in fact, we have the chief of police on the one here in Hudson. We have Officer Wendy on there. Um, the healthcare industry, we have some nurses. We have some social workers. We have folks from Walgreens. I think you say it's the pharmacy, um, pharmacy manager. Yeah. And another person from Walgreens, which is great. Um, Jan's can you think of other folks? There's caregivers. Um, assisted living. There's an assisted living representative. representative. Yes, so we have a lot of folks from all different walks of life, which will be great, because the second phase is the assess phase. And what that is, in the toolkit, there are 11 different surveys or assessments. And so we don't have to reinvent the wheel at all. We can use these surveys. And they're based on sector. So there is a survey for the uh, first responders. And what we'll do is we will get folks to go and interview or survey particular people. So whether it be um, Dr. Sullivan, the eye doctor, and what's his experience with Alzheimer's and in, in, in his business, et cetera. How much does he know about it? Um, what does he think should be done in town to help folks like that? So those kinds of questions will be asked across these different sectors. So it's important for us on our teams to have folks from those different sectors because they obviously have an in with those groups. So we'll do all of those surveys. Um, and I said there's 11 different ones. But once those surveys are completed, those will all go to BayPath. And BayPath will use the tool that's in the toolkit to analyze the surveys and determine where's the high needs. And then that information will come back to the local teams, the three local teams, and they'll look at those results and determine what is it that we need to do in our community. It could be as little as just knowledge. I mean, you know, what's the 10 signs of Alzheimer's? How do you deal with a person that has Alzheimer's? How do you communicate with a person that has Alzheimer's? Uh, could be many things like I have to talk about the parks, you know, we need to get the banks involved. They need to. Like this quicker. I keep clicking the wrong slide. Um, the banks involved, so that they can, they, they're a lot of times the first people that might even notice that something is wrong. That person comes in every day, they want $10, they want $10, you know, and, or they're, they're taking out big um, uh, withdrawals, you know, what's going on? Should their family know about this? And then, once we have all of that information, it's packed together, and that's where we will do some implementation of these things. And across the three towns, we'll share those ideas, we'll share some of the products that come out of those towns, each one of the, uh, the action teams. And again, we put an action plan together, and we start working. And as Arthur says, 
money follows good ideas. So um, through grants, through maybe business sponsorships, personal donations, etc., we'd like to get some of these things done. Resources, as I mentioned, the toolkit, act on Alzheim, act on Alz.org is where you'd find the process that we're using to go through this. And it, it's great because we're not, it's not a group of people coming into town and saying, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. This is the town, this is the people in the community understanding what's the report, what are the needs, and what do we want to do. Dementia Friendly America, this is another effort at, a ne at, at the next level up, which we are part of, um, and they're hoping to implement this across the states instead of just here in Massachusetts. And then, of course, the Alzheimer's Association, which is a wealth of knowledge and, and uh, can be helpful. Um, Arthur had mentioned, um, we were talking about the memory cafes. Um, as a caregiver, you know, I always say the thing I want is a day off. Um, and the memory cafes would be a great way to, to help that happen because I could go to a memory cafe and meet you when you're a caregiver and I'm becoming friendly with you, I feel confident and trust, trusting of this person and maybe she's going to take her mom out for lunch tomorrow and maybe my mom could go with her. And then next week, I'll do the same for you. Kind of like the moms used to do in the neighborhoods, when you take care of my kids this day, I'll take care of your kids another day. So everybody gets a day off. So that's what I'd like. It's classic. It should, that's the kind of stuff that can only be done at the community level. It can only be done at the community. If you're interested in getting involved, we'd love to have you. We specifically are looking for <coughs> folks at this point. We, we have our action teams together, and I think we have plenty of folks on the action team. But what we need is folks for the sub-teams. We need folks to actually go out and do the surveys. We need folks that are interested in community events, you know, like I mentioned, the Hudson Fest. Um, somebody that's going to help us pull that together and be at the table and, and hand out information. So if you're interested in at all, in any way, getting involved in this, or if you have resources that you think would be beneficial to this team that you'd be willing to donate, we want to hear about it. I do have a sheet over on the counter over there, so if you'd like to be involved, just put your name and your email and your phone number on there and I'll get a hold of you and tell you how how we could get you involved with this. Um, there's the, also Janice, you can ask Janice. As or, a matter of fact, we're going to have Janice come up next. All right. And um, in, in Marlborough and in Northborough, we, like I mentioned, we have um, teams going there. If you know somebody or if you're from Marlborough or Northborough and you want to be on those teams, again, same thing. You can contact me. My email address is down here. So there's our Hudson Action Team. So this must be Janice's turn. Janice's turn. Yeah, yeah, you have to go up there. You have to be in front. See, they think it's yeah. easy. You know, I do these and they go, oh, geez. No. It's just not easy. Yeah. I just need that picture. Can't trust me. Do you want more the microphone? Do I need a microphone? No. Um, why is a dementia-friendly community important? Well, it really hits home for me, as many of you probably know. Um, I just lost my mother in January to dementia. She had vascular dementia. And I moved into her house. She had a ranch house in Shelford to take care of her because she was living alone. And I just figured I, I didn't want her to go into a nursing home. I wanted her to stay home as long as possible. And, you know, thank God she was able to be in her house up until the end um, in January. <clears throat> My mother was diagnosed in 2012 with vascular dementia. By the fall of 2013, we were told she can't be left alone, especially at night. And so that's when I moved in. My husband stayed in our house in Marlboro, and he would come on the weekends and sometimes in the middle of the week. And in the beginning, I didn't need and help during the day. I felt like she was okay, but then as time went on, by December, November, December, you could tell um, she needed some assistance in the house while I was at work. So as time went on, we had to hire people to come in and take care of my mom. 
you know, make meals because she was able to get herself dressed and do that kind of thing. She wasn't eating properly. Um, my mother's income was just $200 over any subsidized help that she could get, so we had to private pay for everything. So I just did my mother's taxes for last year, and between February 2015 and August 2015, I spent $11,000 in um, health care for my mom at home. And of course, as the time was going on, so did her disease progress, and she needed more help. Um, doing personal care type things and people, you know, come in and show on her and, and that kind of thing. Why is this important? As my mother's disease was progressing, as I told you, in 2012, she still had her friends. They were able to come over and visit with her. She was able to mask this very well. Um, but then it was becoming more and more difficult. Other behaviors were starting to surface, such as some paranoia, some very suspicious. So as those things started to present themselves, I noticed neighbors weren't coming over anymore because somebody, the, neighbor, the guy next door was walking in the back of our house. She said, what's he doing back there? What is he doing? I think he's doing something back there. Um, so people stayed away. They just stayed away. And um, her church, I can't tell you how many times I called the church. I can't tell you. And nobody came. Finally. I got somebody to come to give her communion. My mother always gave communion to people in her community. She was very involved in her church, so I couldn't, I could not understand the lack of involvement from that sector of our community, or in her community. Couldn't, couldn't understand it. So, um, and then that person said, well, this is a little out of my way. I think we can find somebody in the neighborhood that can do this instead. I, I was truly involved, truly involved. So um, we, we lost that one connection with her church. The priest never came out. Nobody ever came to visit her. Um, I was in the grocery store one day, and somebody came up to me and said, oh my gosh, are you Jan Finn's daughter? Haven't seen you in a dog's age. And I said, yes, I am. I said, you should come visit my mom. Well, I heard she has Alzheimer's. I said, well, she has a form of dementia. He asked, well, she wouldn't she would have known me anyway. And I said, no, that isn't true. My mother was most happy when somebody would come and visit her. She was most happy when she got a phone call. And Lou made a good point when I said, phone, you can't ever underestimate um, a phone call. How a person feels when they get a phone call. So my mother would talk to a lot of people on the, on the phone. We brought up a good point. He said, you're going to be careful because sometimes, you know, you get those scammers on the, on the phone. But in my mom's situation, we always had somebody at the house. So she was, always had somebody there to make sure that that wasn't the case. But that was a good point, though, because people with um, some <coughs> form of dementia can be taken can be scammed easily. So, um, so anyway, uh, you know, that's what she liked. And you know what? You live for the moment when you have this disease. You live for the moment. And, and here's a perfect example. There was a weekend, my husband and I took my mother up. We went out to, we had my um, my grandson, so she had her great-grandson and me and my husband. And we went out to eat, and then we went to the Festival of the Trees at Christmas time. And we just, it was a nice, nice day. So I get her home, and I always, you know, we had dinner, and I get her ready for bed. And I said, Mom, was this a good day? Is this a good day for you? And she said, this was the <laughs> best day I've ever had. I can't remember a day better than this. So I'm getting ready for bed. And I said, I said well, what did you like best about the day? And she said, I don't remember. I don't remember. And she knew it was a good day. And I knew it was a good day because she was happy. She was out with us with her great grandson. She had joy in seeing him run around and had pictures taken with her and him. Um, it was her good day, and it was a day to remember. So why is this important? It's important for me, and it's important for people like my mom, that people in the community stay involved, that you stay connected, that it's that moment in time that you're, you've made a difference for somebody. And that's why this, this program is so important. 
to make a, an awareness in our community that it is for the moment and you can make a difference. Maybe you can learn how to engage in somebody um, with dementia. Certainly, you know, the conversation might be a little different, but it's no less meaningful. It's no less meaningful to them or, or to you because you're helping, you're engaging that person. Here at the Hudson Senior Center, no, I'm running. Um, at the Hudson Senior Center, we have a program called Daybreak, and it's to give people who are taking care of somebody and, um, some respite, three hours a week of respite on Thursday. I actually, now I had somebody come into the house every morning. I couldn't leave to go to work until that person was there. And then I came home, 6 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock, we leave them, and I was with my mother all night. So she wasn't seeing other people. Now, she just wasn't getting out. So I said, Mom, do you want to come to work with me on Thursday? So anyway, she eventually started coming on Thursdays, and she loved it because she was with other people. <coughs> You know, just because you have a disease doesn't mean you can't engage and get joy out of being with people. And I think that's the message here. We have to, um, we're not going to forget about these people who are um, wonderful, vibrant, engaging people in our communities. And my mom was involved in the church, she was involved in the schools. I mean, people my age remembered my mother when they were little. Just because she's older doesn't make her less valuable, less valuable of a person. So I think it's really, um, in memory of my mom, I want Hudson to be aware of this very sad and challenging and difficult uh, disease. And you can make a difference. It doesn't have to be a lot. It doesn't have to be a lot. If we can, we can um, start surveying the different sectors in our community, like the business sector and the faith-based sector, local government. Um, Whatever, as, as uh, Cindy said, there's 11 different surveys. We don't need a ton of them. I mean, if you did one survey, that would be great. Because that's going to give us the information, the data we need. And then our action team will look at that analysis and say, you know what, Hudson's strong in three areas, but there's four areas we, we can use some um, training or whatever. This is where we're going to focus our time on to make Hudson dementia friendly. It does make a difference. It makes a, it made a difference for my mom, and it made a difference for me when she would come here to the center and people treated her with respect and dignity. And um, that's all we all want, right? We all want to be treated with respect and dignity. That's all we want. And, um, and I'll just say one more thing. Like one time I took my mother and my daughter out to dinner, and um, we um, I was bringing this up because I had said something about a restaurant. The waitress came over and could see something was not right with my mom, and she just bypassed my mother and said, what would she like? And I just looked at my mom and I said, mom, what would you like? And that was enough to just kind of shut her down. She just didn't want to communicate. So she and I, I said, well, come back. And so we figured it all out, and then I ordered for her because she didn't want to talk to the waitress. And then when it was all, when we were finished, the waitress came back and said to me, didn't she do a good job on her dinner? You know, that's humiliating, that's embarrassing. And did not give my mother the dignity that my mother deserved. So, um, again, it's just bringing in awareness. How do you engage people? Maybe instead of 10 signs of Alzheimer's, we should have 10 points on how you engage people. Maybe we need somebody, I, told, I shared this story, and somebody um, gave me a card. So this is what they use when they take their mother out. It's just because my, the person I'm with has a form of dementia. So that they knew. You didn't have to say it in front of them, right? So um, we can all work together and make cuts in that community that's going to recognize and, and, and um, value everybody, regardless of what. Okay. Thank you. great. Thank you so good. <laughs> Mention, um, you know, I talked about being involved and maybe um, going out and surveying folks, but if there's anybody in the room that's a caregiver or works in a field in this area um, that would like to fill out a survey, I'd like to know about that because uh, we, we'd love to have you fill one out. So that's the point. The point is to be, wouldn't it be great to be living in a place where at the end of the day you can always say, 
Boy, that was a great day. It doesn't make any difference if you remember what, the, what you did. The question is, can you always be saying, was that a, that's a great community. That's a dementia-friendly community. Thank you so much, Janice. Thank you, Cindy. Hope you get involved. This is really exciting. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it.